we have it's called the Utah Off Road Recovery Team. We're a nonprofit, uh, not not for profit nonprofit uh, recovery team where we just go places where like a normal tow company won't go. So mm -hmm. if they're stuck off the side of the highway, we we say sorry, not sorry, not our deal. But um, remote places is kind of what we do. And we mm -hmm. average two to three weeks. So we had two today, for example. Wow, oh, wow. But they're usually pretty decently backcountry ones, anywhere from you know thirty minutes down a trail to hour down a trail or more hmm. and usually in remote places welcome to the author it again podcast i'm chris i'm ross and i'm kurt and this is our podcast about anything and everything off-road as always uh we're socially distanced i'm in the midwest ross is in the northeast and kurt's in utah and nice cold Utah. Yes, yeah, cold. And tonight, yeah. Kurt and I are in similar temperature weather because it's <laughs> negative six here, where Ross is yep. staring down fifty-eight degrees tomorrow. Fifty-eight tomorrow. Coast. Fifty-eight tomorrow during the day, and eleven tomorrow night. So tonight, it's coming. Kill yeah, for eleven right now, dude. This front is making waves. It is <laughs> not fucking around. Well, that was that's wild. That's that's colder than it is here. So we're we're in the twenties right now. Okay. So I saw like Rochelle uh, posted something today. She was, it was like oh. minus 40 up in Montana. Yeah. yeah. Montana's like, brutal. Well, at that point, it Dude. doesn't matter which scale you're measuring on because minus 40 is the same on Celsius and Fahrenheit. <laughs> they combined, yeah. It's well, funny. And Clay went campy. Clay and Cyrus, are, they decided to go brave the cold and camp. That's masochism. There is no other <laughs> I don't it. disagree. I don't disagree. But, no, I, I, we've been emailing with Dan Grek trying to line up another show and and he's coming from the middle of australia which is you know dead summer and he's flying yeah. into <laughs> like the arctic right now is he really he's like yeah he's going back to canada oh i didn't so, know he's headed back to yeah and to say i mean i think he said it's supposed to be negative 35 when he steps off the plane that, uh, dude i got yeah. a lot of alberta memes all of a sudden today because i guess my temperatures were close enough they were like yeah these will make sense to you like, mm. <laughs> anyway uh, Anyway. Ross, what is your update? It's pretty uh, quick. Very, very quick updates. Um, the further I get into it, the more likely it seems that the GX is going to stick around. Uh, As it should. Chris, you and I were we <laughs> had exchanged a very, very, very brief message today about um, a like mid cycle two hundred that could theoretically replace it, but like you know, it's got a hundred and something thousand miles more than the GX and um, no mods. No mods, and it's you know the other thing like in the Northeast that we always talk about and we always forget about when you go through the hypothetical what should I do next in the vehicle world? Um, a two hundred in the Northeast is a a lot more width than a G than a four sixty. You know, <laughs> it like, is, but it's still not much. You know, I, in the grand scheme of things, like a two hundred's not big, especially like you know after I inevitably in two weeks talk about how obnoxious the hummer is. right you're gonna have the hummer <laughs> in a couple of weeks and you're talking yeah. to sequoia suburban owner and then kurt's yep. got a mega cruiser so like uh -huh. <laughs> we understand Wait, i yep. do understand why <laughs> yep so but again you know a, a 460 in the northeast like i've run some trails where it was mirrors in and it was still you know like still tight still getting beat up um so yeah, so the the four sixty is probably gonna stay. Um, I exchanged an email with CBI, and we might do some armor for it, which is Woo! good because the um, side steps are. You hate the side uh, steps so much. Yeah, I, I so my <laughs> I I like to replace things as they need to be replaced, and the running boards are one of those things where I've bashed them up enough that they're. In like a state of disrepair, but I haven't bashed them up enough that I have to take them off the truck yet, you know, because I've been like kind of daintily going through the first few wheeling trips with this thing because it's the nicest vehicle I've ever had by a factor of 12. <laughs> that you actually um, wheel. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. So next step is sliders and skids and then, you know, then gears and lockers. And See, they this. look completely untouched. Yeah. In that picture. Yeah, because that picture is so almost four months old. <laughs> that picture says September, but that picture was taken in, uh, I think, August. So, okay. yeah. Um, anyways, that's it. Those are all my updates. Nothing Sweet. Else. 
Yeah. My, mine is very short. It is a part two to what we talked about last week. So my Kurt, my Terrifying. oldest is 14. Um, okay. so right. In the state of Kansas, he has a an instructional permit, um, which I think is hilarious because if we actually lived in anywhere near a farm, he'd have been popping clutches since he was like eight. Um, <laughs> but we don't. So uh, we actually went back out for a second time and he was so much better this time. The first first time he made me nauseous in five minutes. Um, oh, that's and what funny. It, we, uh, I, I gave him a little more. I helped him plot his path a little bit this time. And so he had a little bit more of a vision of where he was going this time, as opposed to just reacting to things I said. So I was like, hey, we're, we're going to go up the stop sign here. Well, that stop sign's two lights away kind of thing. So plan ahead. Um, and then eventually, um, so he, he, for his high school, we, we literally live a half mile from a high school. Um, but he actually goes to high school 20 minutes on the other side of town because he's in a program um, that focuses on um, sustainability and the program is called Green Tech. One side sustainability and the other side, I think, is it's uh, alternative energy. Thank you, Ross. The ag gets folded into sustainability. Um, <laughs> Pretty cool. Sounds like a neat program. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah, he absolutely loves it. Stuff. Sure, but it sucks driving forty minutes or twenty minutes there and back every time to do anything for him. And high schoolers are constantly doing things. Um, and so like we drove the path to his high school the other day and he actually did a pretty good job. Um, there are two traffic circles right out front of his high school and mm. he, he did not do well this first time going through the traffic circles. I was like, we've got plenty of time. We will figure these out. It's okay. We didn't hit anything. Um, he only made me panic, uh, break on the passenger side a couple of times where there's no pedal. So I was just yep. smashing the floorboard over there. It didn't fire well. But yeah. Well, no, so, there's like, there was no damage. That's a win. Yeah, no damage, no scrapes. Maybe, maybe a little. His, I feel like his ego went up and then came down just a little bit and <laughs> it went back up. So you were um, in a suburban. Yes, yeah. that's a lot. That's a lot of vehicle. It's it's for, a lot of vehicle. A you've never world. really driven yeah. anything. Yeah. yeah, I mean, on the bright side, if something gets fucked up, at least you can upgrade it in the process. <laughs> There's no upgrades for suburbans, Ross. We take the this. Yeah. I, 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 there are something. Fat. No, there there are <laughs> upgrades. It, it's just, it's a, a significant portion of what the suburban costs in the first place to actually do it. Right. And yeah, off-road bumpers on it don't seem right. Like if anything, I'd replace it with the Z71 front bumper cover just to create some ground clearance. So like I... Mm -hmm. The metal bumpers that I've seen for the Suburban just don't oh, look they good. Look. Like the way a 100 series and a 200 looks, even an 80, like Toyota's wearing off-road bumpers, Land Rover's wearing off-road bumpers, like they should be there. On a Suburban, eh. even like GMT 800 and 900s off-road no. bumpers look okay. Nah, and the new one, like your body and newer, it's like. Yeah, it just looks. It looks it's dumb. like, it's, uh, it's phoning it in from SEMA. Yeah, and it, and I know what it is. Like it's it's our people hauler. Like it's not. I literally have been starting to scout for like cheap off roady things that I could eventually yes. have as a trail rig. And we're gonna um, talk about this in other shows. Yeah, to, <laughs> we'll talk to about to it the nth show. degree. Yep. Yeah, I yeah. Let's let's just say there's a. Uh, I have certain friends that keep sending me incredibly cheap Land Rover listings. <laughs> Oh, like God. incredibly, yeah. and they're like, we can fix them. I'm like, guys, like your friend so, Ron. Yeah, uh, Ron's one of them, and Brett's the other one. Like, yep. It's, the the they are my two notorious uh, enablers. So, speaking of Land Rovers, um, I did email Larry Casilla about the Camel Trophy truck. Yeah, that, that he, he was has. detailing. Uh, that that ship has long since sailed by probably an extra zero or two on my budget for a toy oh, oh okay uh -huh. <laughs> yep uh -huh. you said extra so, zeros or two you know, dude it's like i think it has like seventeen thousand miles like it's an oh, original oh, okay yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no it, it's no, yeah, I'm, that's a collector's the, item that's not yeah it's going in a museum somewhere yes yeah, i don't wanna... it's 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 not so like no um and speaking of museums <laughs> We have Kurt, so I think the the best way to uh, to jump into this is how'd you start your night? Um, not in the museum, oh. very much in a snowbank, apparently. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've worked all day at the shop here, busy day, because it's kind of the one of the last shipping days before Christmas. So I had some next day air stuff going out. And I don't think it's like stuff going underneath the Christmas tree so much as people needed parts for the mm-hmm. holiday weekend to keep them busy. So there was a lot of yep. shipping, and normal ground shipping and freight shipping too. So busy day at the shop. Christmas but then friends. got a, yeah. uh, a call to go do a quick recovery, which is always fun when somebody's stuck in the snow. You know, we like to like to go use our toys. So we were talking before and into when we hit record, but you said you're part of a, a local recovery squad. Mm-hmm. Um, and your recoveries vary from anywhere from like nearby to an hour or two out onto the trail. Yeah, I mean, it's really all over like northern, the northern half of Utah uh, is where we'll go. I, I was just saying like usually the, the typical recovery is going to be, you know, 10 minutes down a dirt road to an hour down a dirt road. Mm-hmm. They're not you know, super, super remote. They're usually just people get into a little pickle, not too far from safety, but these are places a traditional like wrecking company won't go, a a tow company. In fact, that's kind of our, uh, the way we run is if a normal tow company will go get somebody out, it's not our job to try and replace that business. We get referrals from tow companies when they say like, hey, we got this call from these guys and we're not taking our tow truck into there. We're going to be stuck too. So we've got obviously a lot of more fun, enjoyable off-road toys that we like to go use. So it's a good chance for us. <laughs> I love doing it because the Shake way I run. run yeah. is uh, if I tell my wife, Hey, I'm going to go off-roading tonight with some buddies on a Wednesday night. She's <laughs> like, Oh, the hell you say we've got stuff to do around the house. We had plans. Right? But sure. if I say, Hey, somebody's stuck, you know, we just got a call out on this situation. SOS kind of like slides me out. I get to go. You still get to go play and go off-roading and play the tour. Right. So, Right. In the end, it's the same project, but uh, yep. somehow the missus hasn't caught on to the fact we're still having fun doing it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's it's such a weird, like, Venn diagram overlap kind of thing in, in that capacity because, like, we've all seen the Facebook things where, like, a guy goes into what's a dry lake bed and, and sinks mm-hmm. a forerunner up to the frame. And, you know, it, it's a two-day recovery and, like, the local crew has to truck out two times in a row with, like, heavy wreckers. Um, and we, you know, everybody's also latched onto like the mats off road recovery kind of stuff. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But if you can, you know, swing like a fun little adventure to, <laughs> to recover somebody, then, yeah. you know, it's, it's the best of both worlds. Um, and we've done quite a few, like they, we've had referrals from Matt's like stuff that's up North. He set people our way and, and vice versa. And Rory, who does like the trail mater down the Moab mm-hmm. area, mm-hmm. we've sent people his way and John Marshall's in the Moab area. So we kind of work pretty nicely. Like if we were to get a call for somebody in the Moab area stuck, that's not our job to go. There's already awesome guys, tic-tac-toe, Rory. Um, there's, there's a handful of folks in John Marshall that do off-road recovery down there. So that's a situation where we just say, Hey, get a hold of these guys. Yeah, they charge, but they're going to take care of you. Um, right. we don't charge. That's kind of our thing. They're welcome to make a donation, but we are a nonprofit for that reason that we we're not for profit. We, we just do it cause it's fun to go use our toys. <laughs> sure. And, and you- in the Northern Utah, we have a big lake bed out there and the salt flats and no shortage of people get stuck in that throughout the year too. Oh, I was, man. I was there. <laughs> yeah. I get, we get a lot of people, uh, that probably, probably average one a month. It's like a pretty good stuck out in the mud flats. And there are, there are a couple companies that do that, that use a snow cat out there to get people out. But there's times that they'll even say, no, nope, we're not going to, it's too far away to take our cat to that location. So okay. they'll even turn them down. Dude, is your, is your general recovery, like, you know, a, a, a Jeep or a Toyota, or is it more like super? Um, it heavily skews to the vehicles we see out on the trail a lot. And okay. so like this year has been Tacoma after Tacoma after Tacoma and like <laughs> our social media, we have Facebook and Instagram where we kind of talk about some of our recoveries, just do little recovery reports. People always say, Oh, another Tacoma. Oh, another Tacoma. And they're not wrong. Like we have been doing a lot of Tacoma right. it's often because that's kind of what you see out on the trails a lot. And they probably skew towards a younger demographic of off-roader that maybe is a little newer to their vehicle and their equipment and places to put it. But yeah, we've done super duties. We've done, um, a lot of rollovers, like just people full on rollover down pretty gnarly Canyon. So we la- last year alone in one exact location, we did three recoveries, uh, three rollover recoveries, like nearly within a Jesus. quarter mile of each other at a really popular. And it's like open year round. So 
people run out of talent there year round. <laughs> Good God. I love I mean, that phrase. <laughs> there's a huge skew between yoinking somebody up a snowbank and and a rollover recovery. Oh that's, yeah, we've done we've done a, no lot of, a lot of rollover recoveries, like pretty decent, like three and four winch operation ones. Good worked God. with search and rescue and uh work a lot with Davy Davis County Sheriff Department who uh, been in the mm-hmm. service. We've done some gnarly ones too, some suicide attempt ones. A guy drove his vehicle, a uh, Chevy Avalanche, off a hillside, and yeah, we've yeah, there's there's us right there, and there's some of the ones we've done, and that and that I was on that one. That was I don't know eighty to a hundred feet off the hillside too. So then we've got that. That's actually me standing there. Yeah, that's that's me up on the hillside there. Those are gnarly, you know, and that's uh, that was a forerunner, and uh, fortunately the kid survived, and he was able to crawl out. That happened at night. And he oh was able gosh. to crawl out and get back to the road. And then a passerby saw him. And that's in the Bountiful Bee area. And if you cycle through our Facebook, you will see no shortage of Bountiful Bee recoveries. It's like our honey hole. Yeah. <laughs> it's Off-roading has made a huge mark on the automotive enthusiast mainstream presence over the last, especially, you know, two and a half years or whatnot. Um, but overconfidence and I guess you know, just overconfidence goes a long way to get you in a, a sticky situation real quick. Uh, yeah, and I'll say something. That, I mean, this is a total tangent, but hey, we can get off in the weeds here, I suppose, right? Um, one thing that I really noticed oh. both, I mean, I sell parts all day, every day. Yeah, there's another, that's in that same area. Another, that's a Tacoma that rolled over up in that God same B area. I mean, I, I we've probably done a dozen rollovers up there in the last two years, two, three years or more. And then lots of other stocks too, but lots of rollovers. Cause as you can see, oh, you nice. slide off the road, it's yeah. pure consequence off the hillside. It's real steep stuff. And that's so close to Salt Lake that it attracts maybe the ill-prepared. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. But on the note of ill-prepared is everybody loves to spend money on their vehicle. You buy all the accessories, the suspension, the bumper, the wheels, the tires, maybe even recovery gear, the winch, the stuff. Yep. But Max tracks, uh, not? Yep. Max tracks, whatnot. But sometimes, and I'd say this is more true with men than women. Men are like, they're not willing to invest in the training on how to use that equipment sometimes. Um, and I think I, that's just because women uh, are often better drivers and more willing to say, hey, I want to learn how to properly do this. We're guys, we're like, nah, grandpa's been using a chain for 30 years. Hell yeah, I'm going to use that to tug something mm-hmm. out of the snowbank. But mm-hmm. there's probably a better way. And But I am seeing that change. Uh, we see more and more enthusiasts. And, and part of these organizations I, I do stuff with, we do off-road training as well. Um, some of them are just skills camp that are free for people. And some of them are paid off-road training. But you do see that, that like more and more people are saying, hey, I need to learn about this gear. A winch is great if you know how to use it, right? Yeah. It yeah. can if be scary and dangerous get if you yourself don't high perfect. lift. Yeah. yeah. If you don't get yourself perfect. In a high lift, everybody thinks they're scary until they actually see how to properly and comfortably use one. And then they have a healthy respect for it rather than a fear of it. Mm-hmm. There are two very different sides of a high lift. And I think everybody in the off-road, you know, off-road world has seen both of those. Sure. So, yeah. But it's a, um, it's an amazing tool. It can lift, it can spread, clamp, it can... Uh, you know, do, do all winch. Yeah. You can do all sorts of neat things, right? Uh, yeah. There's not really much out there that does that. I'm saying it's the perfect tool, but if you know how to comfortably use it, it's a great tool. Mm-hmm. We use it a lot on the recovery team. Use it a lot in some of the other uh, projects we do. Yeah, that's me yep. too. Yep. Hi. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I I don't know if it was. I think probably last time we talked, um, you had been tagging along on. It might have been a press drive or something, and there were people who got a little too. Uh, to deep into their lack of skill set and and it became a recovery situation on a you know on a on a press drive and yeah the tools that you have available to you ooh that's a nice fifth gen forerunner track yeah. we're seeing um but yeah no the the tools that are available and that have become like mainstream and present in the in the off-road world are just as awesome as like the stuff that helps get you stuck you know um and and we're seeing it in, in the max tracks and the soft shackles and all that stuff so yeah no every it's slippery slippery slope and and that's a uh that's a a pun of puns <laughs> yeah well yeah, that is so, a pun of, I, no I would love to great go year to those classes there. yeah they're, yep. they're fun that some of those photos you were just showing there were from the international four-wheel drive trainers association that is an organization i am uh, wholeheartedly part of. And so, uh, full disclaimers aside, I 
I'm going to bias to saying that's a great organization to get training from because there are trainers all over the United States and, and internationally. Um, so if you so if a listener happens to be looking like, hey, how do I find a vetted, responsible professional trainer? That's a great organization to network with. Those photos that you were just showing, those are part of a, a, a week long. It's called testing for certification. That's trainers that want to go do a week long uh, testing to kind of uh, put themselves out there to be a certified trainer in the future. So that was a, a training class uh, that we I, I help as many do. There's 30 plus people that make that all happen every year, all trainers. I, I'm fortunate to get to teach the recovery math class because I'm a math nerd. Uh, but yeah, you got <laughs> the I4W, the I4WTA is a, internet, a great group of like some amazing human beings that have done cool stuff all over and uh, pretty much have coverage throughout uh, certainly North America and definitely international for those that want to uh, get some great hmm. skills and learn. Interesting. Um, let's stay international. So you just went on a little adventure. <laughs> with uh with ex guests of the show xo and and uh and i th- you, you were there with richard and ashley from death to glory death to glory yeah. too yeah so. Ash- i missed ashley because ashley kind of came in after i came out so there was a little bit of shifting of just because of scheduling and timing yeah. i i did the uh northern europe with exhibition overland so richard from uh, death to glory and he works with exhibition overland a lot as well mm-hmm. Uh, he was there the entire time. So I got to spend a lot of wonderful time with him. And I had to get back because we had some other race events. I had a Toyota media drive event uh, in, yeah. back to the destination yeah. outdoor event, but also had We're a lot of prep to do that. for the Baja 1000. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. <laughs> been, a, okay. been a busy year. So I, I yeah, had a great time in Northern Europe and I'm, I'm super excited to see the footage because I have, I've seen none of it. Clay yeah. sent me a screenshot so, tonight of like something. And I was like, wow, that looks amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's all I've so, seen. So X Overland does their, you know, their annual uh, adventure excursion, whatever you'll call it for the, you know, for the listener, just to set the stage here. And this year's was Norway and Northern Europe. Um, so, so you joined for the Northern portion of it. What, what was the terrain like? I mean, you know, the, the stuff you can tackle just in like one country alone up there is is mind blowing. So what, what portion of the trip did you do? I did all of the Europe section, like the North. Uh, so basically we start, we like Belgium, Netherlands, and then drove through, up through Germany, Denmark. We spent the bulk of our time in uh, Norway, Finland, and Sweden. So those okay, three sure. Northern countries, cause that's like really the gorgeous. Side. Then mm-hmm. the t- after completion of all that, I flew out of, uh, where did I fly out of? Probably Norway or Sweden. I can't remember which one I flew out of. Um, and just like, got back to the U S they then shipped the vehicles to Iceland. So I wasn't able to do okay. the Iceland portion. That's all part of like the Nordic series. Cause those are all what most consider like the Scandinavian Nordic country. So uh, I missed the tail half of it, which looked amazing in Iceland. I've only <laughs> been through Iceland one time on a quick little blip as we were going to do the Greenland trip years ago, uh, three, four years ago. So yep. Iceland's totally on my bucket list. And I was so wanting to go on this one, but uh, other Dude. stuff. Chris and I both canceled Iceland trips in 2020. So we feel you. Uh, we feel your. Problem. I didn't cancel. Yeah. I had it canceled on me. You had it well, yeah. canceled. Same. Uh, I I canceled because it was, you know, supposed to happen like as the world literally closed down. Yeah. Uh, so so mine, mine was in the trips booked. You were heading. You had all lined up, dude, and then just things fell apart. I yeah. had hotels uh, and flights and, uh, um, and, and a chimney and like the F roads all plotted out and everything. You had it dialed. Dude, I yeah. had a, a guided yeah. tour with Arctic oh. trucks in one of their Hiluxes with the 44s. Like, oh man. Yep. So, what kind of terrain did you actually? Was it like, is it is it mostly volcanic kind of stuff what you did or was it? No. So, so northern, and... the, the areas we were, um, it is not a technical off-roaders paradise i'll say that it is amazing it's beautiful like driving through the mountains of norway and the fjords and the, like heading in and out of the coastal roads and the Atlantic overlanders road. paradise yeah amazing and i would say also like a motorcycle tourist paradise or it is yep. so gorgeous yep. however it's not super technical um and th- this is speaking again to like Finland, Sweden, Norway. So we're very rich with history. We found some really cool World War II history and encampments and batteries. Mm. But you're not going to find super technical routes. In fact, in Norway, 
Um, it's like the law kind of says, and I'd have to remember, par I'm paraphrasing this, so don't quote me uh, exactly, but basically you're not allowed to drive on anything that isn't an engineered road. That doesn't mean it has to be a paved road, but it has to be like a graded road. And they have an amazing grade, like hmm. infrastructure of mountain roads that service people's uh, like holiday homes and cabins and their like their kind of vacation lodges hmm. and just remote, beautiful areas. But you're not going to find like super technical uh, routes, even if they're remote, they're still like pretty well cared for. They'd be like the equivalent of like a graded major BLM road, like through Nevada or through Utah. Uh, so you could get into yeah. like some bad season and the roads can get rough. So they were certainly washboardy and potholy. This, they weren't just smooth roads, but yeah. they're not like super technical. And that's just kind of how those cultures are there. They're very, uh, they, they protect their resource. They're very sensitive about their resource and where you can drive and where you can camp. However, they do exercise, there's a name for it. It's on the tip of my tongue, but it's basically called every man's right. And you can treat the entire country like BLM land, meaning you're welcome to pull up and camp everywhere as long as it's not like cultivated land. So even if it's hmm. private property, as long as you're respectful, I'm not, I'm not saying you drive your vehicle onto that land. So you park adjacent to the road. And there's like a little flat pass of patch of grass that may or may not be public land. You don't, you don't really have a way to know. It's totally socially acceptable to camp there as long as you leave it better than you found it or as good as you found it. So camping was no problem to find some really cool camp spots because everyone, it just has such a culture. And there was, there's a very big uh, van and RV uh, touring community there. A lot of them coming from uh, lower in Europe, Germany, a lot of Switzerland, kind of some of the Southern countries go up to, mm -hmm. Norway and Nordcap in this in the summer months. That's another. I see that you're killing me here because that's an Iceland shot. For Is sure. it? <laughs> <laughs> we'll just we'll have to put Iceland on the calendar. It and all just, looks the just same. Say, Fuck, we're doing it. Yeah, we're getting there. We're gonna get there. That, well, that sounds that's great though. It's it's like the common courtesy that you expect of the world and hope of the world. You know, just like extrapolated to things that we like to do. Yeah. in terms of of camping and places to stay so so that that last picture like scenery is like seemed like that that was like every day could be that at these other just amazing lakes amazing mountains i mean that's that's how cool the camping is so not super technical mm -hmm. to get there but just amazing and like we were able to go all the way to nord cap which is like kind of the furthest northern point in europe the continent of europe that you can drive so it kind of checked the box of like a really cool uh uh land-based feature continental vigil we've kind of been to the tip of south america the north like trying to hit all those um, but nord cap's really cool just because of how far north it is up there it's a long haul and then we pretty much turned east and just kind of as a weird time to be doing it admittedly and we did it very respectfully but we wanted to see how close we could camp to russia so we camped right on the <laughs> norway russia border uh, about like 15 uh... feet from the border proper <laughs> And uh, it's very oh, well marked. Man. There's a river, about a 30 foot wide river, kind of varies 30 to 50 feet, call it. And the center line of that river is the international mm -hmm. border between those two countries. And you can camp right on the border and it's totally acceptable to do so. There's, but there's, it's really funny. There's signs up that say like no gestures towards Russia, no throwing rocks towards Russia, no <laughs> towards Russia. Yeah, that's right on the border, right? There. That's like, funny. That's so far the, removed right behind from... us is a little river. And those oh, mountains man. you're seeing on the other side, that's like Russia on the other side. So that's it's, crazy. Uh, it's pretty trippy how close you can get. And no issues, no incidents. We did run across some soldiers, Norwegian soldiers. There's a lot of uh, military presence on that side because they're obviously mm -hmm. keeping an eye on each other where those borders meet. And it's been disputed land over the years, you know, dating back hundreds of years. But uh, they just said, yeah, you know, be Bust respectful. <laughs> can't, can't be respectful. We don't want... And we don't want to be these ugly Americans causing an international incident on the border. Yeah. So <laughs> Imagine. We, we, I'm it's sure just so horrible. So sure horrible. So <laughs> we were just we just enjoyed the moment. There were a lot uh, of other people camping there. There's a lot of great camp spots, but it was kind of fun to say, yeah, I camped like 15, 20 feet from Russia. Now Clay and I got a drive through Russia years ago, back when uh back with Expedition Seven, we drove all the way across Russia right. to Mac. But oh, times yeah. have changed. You can't yeah. do that yeah. trip right now. Like, that's not happening at current. Not now. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hope one day again, because it is an amazing country, but uh, not well, like, you and McGregor's not, not making any more series headed through Russia either right now. Like, no, yeah, I, sure. I don't think Yeah, it's, it's not a not a place to be right now. It's an yeah. uh, like, unfortunate situation. If we're getting yeah. off road coverage out of Russia, it's from Russians. Like, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they do some cool stuff there. Yeah. Like, no doubt. Oh, yeah. Really cool stuff. They, they got some 
some wheeling going on there. Is it the um, is the Sherp Russian or Ukrainian originally? Russian. That's Russian. out of like it's northern, okay. uh, yeah. like Siberia, Russia. That's where yeah. those things were like yeah. bread built because they're so perfect for that terrain. I had, I had a fun interaction on Twitter the other day. Somebody mentioned something as being in Siberia, and it's that there. Ross, you remember when we talked to? Oh, was it Scott who did the Far From Home? Yes. Yeah. Um, and he talked about that that natural gas pit in Turkmenistan mm-hmm. that's still yep. burning. Yep. Somebody referenced that pit being in Siberia, and I did the nerd actually. <laughs> it's in Turkmenistan, and Peter from the drive <laughs> basically circled all of Russia and all of the stands and said Siberia. Mm. And I was like, I forgot who I was discussing this with, but that adds up. Funny. <laughs> well, because yeah, yeah, that, that kind of area blends together a little bit. Like, here's another thing that always tripped me out about. Siberian Russia, like out to Magadan in those areas, and Tom Tor. That's actually like kind of Asia as well. It's like Asia. Russia mm-hmm. spans. It's not just Europe. It's also yeah. it spans Asia too. And it's you kind of have to think. I had to think about that. Maybe others. Yep. It makes complete sense. But that was traveling through Asia, but you're in Siberian Russia. Yeah, you're mm-hmm. still in a particular country, but you're not right. really on the same continent anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of weird how that works. Yeah. Yep. So all right. So so what uh. What vehicles did you have when you were in your portion of the trip? It looked like from the pictures, fifth gen forerunner, third gen Tacoma, and new Tundra. Was it? You got it. Yep. It yep. That same the same vehicle the whole time. Yeah, the okay. new Tundra. Yep. So that's the fleet right there. Um, the new Tundra was super impressive. I think everybody, everyone's been worried about what that's going to happen with a new platform, new motor when things change so much. But mm-hmm. fl- that truck was flawless, and it got really good fuel economy. It's a big truck for those roads. Like people mention that to us over and over. Like, wow, yeah. Tundras are big trucks because they're used to the Hilux. And the Tacoma, like, just got mistaken as a Hilux the whole time. But the Tundra, they certainly knew it was big. And any off-road enthusiast we ran into or just people that kind of knew the trucks thought, man, that's a really big truck. And, and they're not wrong. It, it is a big truck, but mm-hmm. it was totally fine on those. Because meanwhile, mm-hmm. they're driving semi-trucks and, like, camp giant rv campers so right. like we didn't fill that out of place in fact i don't <laughs> rochelle drove that the most that was kind of her she piloted that and, and made that home and she had no issues she's a fantastic driver but uh no issues at all like getting that anywhere we need to go is that is it a hybrid or is it, like is it the so there's no that, the, that one's not a hybrid yet the hybrid, hybrid has, okay. wasn't out yet um okay I think you'll see some of that next so stuff in the future is that, that technology, cool stuff, but not yet, not on that. Yeah. Okay. What did it start life as, you know? Was it a an SR5 or a... Oh. It wasn't a TRD Pro, because I don't think TRD Pros had actually landed by then. No, but, I think it was... I, I don't remember the trim on it. It's a maroon truck. I, I I have spent in and around it a whole lot of time, but I couldn't even tell you what it started its life as. It was a pretty quick build. Okay. So XO yeah. got that up in Montana, and that thing was getting built like within days of arriving or the day of arriving parts were already there and that thing got wrapped mm-hmm. and changed and uh, suspension and it was on its way to uh, it made it to Overland Expo in the West event down in Flagstaff. And then it shipped like right shortly, not too long after to get over to Europe mm-hmm. in time for a trip. It was a pretty okay. super short window. Um, but, and now I feel silly because I, of course I was down there for that and did not see that <laughs> truck at all. There's yeah, so I was much like, stuff at an I expo. Get, so booth. Okay. It, yeah, okay. it was a big year. Speaking of things that took no time to, uh, to take advantage of, can you tell us about the LX 600 race truck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, which um, we had fun text the other day because you got referenced on a podcast with Larry Chen, yes. like your image, all of your whole team. So they talked about yeah. you guys for a good five, seven minutes. We were like, Kurt, we're going to talk yeah. to you. I'll go check you that made out. A, uh, you made a, a very quick appearance on the smoking tire and in some pictures. Funny. <laughs> Apparently Larry Chen grabbed some good ones of, he, of he you. Did. I think uh, riding shotgun in the 600. Yeah. I co-drove um, from the start line to, to, kind of ultimately uh what was about race mile 75 is where i was hopping out so at that point i had to kind of get rushed down and then i i hopped in our car so we we had the opportunity uh lexus uh some some friends of lexus and, and friends of toyota japan including uh koyari san who is the chief engineer of the pre- previous generation land cruiser being the mm-hmm. 200 series and the 70 series uh he's a really neat gentleman and total land cruiser enthusiast when he he was working with Joust, who built this LX600, and it is a, such a gorgeous build, he kind of recommended they reach out to us just to talk a little bit about racing. And uh, we've worked on a lot of projects behind the scenes with Lexus and Toyota over the years. So kind of 
they put us in contact and we spooled up some conversations and uh, soon it turned into us kind of basically doing all their race support to come race the vehicle. So everything hmm. from we hauled the vehicle around, I stored the vehicle here at my shop and we did some of the last last minute prep to it and helped him with spare parts and helped him with all the, all the logistics of getting it to and from Mexico and getting it, uh, their spares, their home, their, their parts, their tires, their fuel. So mm-hmm. it was an awesome opportunity. And that kind of even ratcheted up when they asked if a few of us would be willing to be co-drivers in the car and kind of help them, uh, you know, see what the race is all about. And it, that was a lot of fun. So I, I got to take the first position and uh, go off the start line with, uh, Noto-san, who is an amazing, great driver. And he did much of the build on the car, if not all the build in Japan before they shipped it over. And it's a gorgeous Jesus. build. Dude, it's awesome. It's so yeah, cool. gorgeous. It, yeah. it looks I mean, like it's been fully out HBC. for five years. You know, it's not like sometimes you see the first off-road or race build of a new vehicle. And it's like, ugh. but this looks like it's been going on for a while. So, all right. So it started as a, a new LX600, which... Uh, yeah, that is it's a, the same it's, thing. It's the same idea as the Tundra we were just talking about. You know, the same platform. Yep, you uh, got it. It's got the, the the V6, the twin turbo V6. Yep. That, that started its life. I mean, they didn't they had a very small build window just because they knew they wanted to race in the program. They got the vehicle uh working with Lexus and Toyota Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh and that is actually it's left hand drive, so it is a US spec uh vehicle, US spec LX and all the interior stuff you can see the dash is on right there like yeah, all the every, yep. control modules all of that works still has glass and wipers windshield hvac still works but then all the race uh, accoutrements are like so tied in nicely in there like the switch pro style uh switching and the back stuff is it's incredibly well done what's the uh what's the suspension on this so it's running some very prototype really neat uh kyb shocks so they really uh, if you look at the kind of a lot of the names on the car they were fortunate to work with a lot of great uh japan brands which joust is an aftermarket manufacturer Hmm. of kind of neat jdm parts um, and they worked with some of like the Kirtsu companies. Like if like you go back to that seat photo there, um, yep. the name on go one more, you'll even see like Toyota. That's like a, a Toyota Kirtsu company that makes parts. I can't remember what that one is hmm. or one of the dealers. So they just worked with a lot of like cool companies that build stuff for Toyota or build JDM market parts. And one of those is KYB. So they worked with KYB no and shit. KYB had engineers and, and uh, some reps there on site at the race with us. Um, kind of some of their marketing and sales team. I can't remember exactly what the wow. roles were. Awesome folks that uh, rolled uh, through the race with us. And um, they kind of knew suspension was, we honestly always thought and kind of told them, hey, that's going to be your biggest hang up in speed because Wait. different than Dakar, yeah. and different than Rally, um, suspension is huge in Baja because like that controls all your your ability to carry any speed and compliance. Like no doubt the, the motor in that LX600 will push it as fast as you kind of can comfortably mm-hmm. drive, but it's going to be mm-hmm. suspension. So um, they were very stock suspension, more so than even the stock class, which they run in, we run in subsequently too, even requires. So I think they'll come back next year with a, a lot more suspension underneath mm-hmm. there and still be follow spec class rules, stock class rules, but they can, they can definitely get some more travel and some more shock underneath the car. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's super will- interesting. I mean, you, you know, you usually expect to hear the name, like the icons and the kings and the fox yeah. and all that stuff. So, KYB throwing their hat in the ring. That's that is not a name that I expected to hear. That's yeah, they're they're cool real, uh, it's a prototype shock. I mean, they they had such they just got some really cool resources like the coils that are on that. Other, those come from like an OE Japanese manufacturing. <laughs> they were able to get like custom <laughs> spring rate coils built for the race yeah. car, and uh, their spares were amazing. They they brought over a team of four mechanics that are all like top shelf Toyota mechanics from Japan. And these guys, like their spares and their tools were so dialed. I mean, like just everything was in organized bins and spare coils of all different spring rates and they, a super dialed team. So we're excited at the opportunity if we, if it prevails to work with them next year as well and hope to get them to the finish line. 
sounds like the dream to work with <laughs> setting something up for uh for if not victory levels of success at least like comfort on you know on the on the racetrack so, yeah and i think they they've always kind of said early on that this was a multi-year plan they you know 50 percent of teams don't finish annually right at each wow yeah. 1000 so you're you're pretty unrealistic if you think you're going to show up the first time mm-hmm. ever to a race you've never run in a type of racing you've never done and in a car you've never raced and a brand new build all together and finish the race. So they were very um, realistic that there was a good chance they weren't going to finish the race. And at some point they may need to pull the plug because of time, which subsequently would, would end up happening. And also that vehicle got air freighted back to Japan right after the race, because that's going in. That was, that was just at a big Toyo event in Japan and it's going in a big, um, the Tokyo auto salon in January. So mm-hmm. they kind of also knew that they didn't want to like push it so hard. That they were going to destroy it and still not finish the race. So they kind of mm-hmm. took the honorable position of saying, Hey, at some point we'll pull the plug. And that happened because of some fuel issues. It looks it's so just good. Handsome. It look good. Just so handsome. Uh, how did the, look. how did the 200 go? Last time you were on the show, we talked about the 200 and the 200, 200 rocked. Man. 200 made another a... appearance this year. Yep, that, uh, had how'd that appearance. Go? We finished first in class and had a great run nice. and came over the finish line and, we had super minimal issues. In fact, the only issue we had is we lost. We we it's got uh, an aftermarket brake master cylinder on there, a dual master cylinder. One cylinder controls the front, one controls the rear, and there's a little rod in between that like biases between the two, and the pedal pushes on that rod, and you can adjust a. That's actually a knob on the dash that you can move the pedal input side to side to bias your brakes. Very manual. Like we have no power brakes on that vehicle, and they work amazingly oh. well for a race car. Um, but that bias rod bent. And oh, so no. we either had all the brake because it would be bent in the position locking brake master cylinder pressure or bent in the way that like it wasn't pushing on the cylinders much at all. And oh, that God. started kind of during my leg roughly from like, I think I, I was like a 585 to 800 range or something like that. And so we either had all the brakes in the world and meaning like we were smoking the brakes and our rotors were red hot Full lock or, every time you push the pedal do or, not even pushing the pedal like just even an ambient like we were having to use the gas to push back past the brakes it was horrible oh we, jesus so we were like man what are we gonna do so we fiddled with it we got out of the car it's so horrible getting in and out of the car because you just start getting depressed after you just barely get buckled <laughs> back you got to get back out but that happened and then noto who was the uh driver of record f- for the joust car he was able to hop in the car with me for like about a 50 mile section. And during that section, that bias rod broke, just broke in half. So oh. we had like 10% of our brakes. So it was brutal. We had to slow down a lot, uh, which isn't fun to do, but also it was kind of just sketch to not having, like there was no way the car would skid. If I were to jam on the brakes, it would slow the brakes, but it wouldn't even lock up the tires. So we really had to just like scale back and had some hard hits into ditches and stuff. Cause we couldn't slow down, but we got into the pits and the, the guy's, uh, rigged up a, a repair in the pits and Will and uh, Bryson took it to the finish line and the brakes were never awesome the whole rest of the race, but they got us to the finish line. <laughs> so yeah, we had, that was our only issue. And actually, if your only issue is like one little bolt in between and it's like a special machine bolt, but if like it, we're talking like a couple hundred dollars worth of repair. Now, the brakes got so hot, they were red hot in some of the photos. Like we probably melted every seal in the axle, but at the end of the day, the thing like drove on off the trailer. It's probably one of the best uh performances we've had as far as like the least amount of damage to the car we didn't hit any cactuses we didn't rip any lights or fenders off so we're happy with it it sounds so sketchy though like you can come away from it saying you're happy with it and it went great but that sounds from afar so sketchy like 10 percent of brake pressure or braking ability is i mean I don't know. I don't well, know. it was a little sketch. And actually, when I handed the car off to Will, uh, one of our longtime team members, and Will actually works for Toyota USA, Will was getting it after we'd done that little repair. And that, that brake repair was done with a normal, like, total cheesy grade three bolt from a that somebody had in one of their parts bins. <laughs> and actually, all of us were like, Will, man, like, don't stomp on the pedal too hard ever. Because mm. if that bolt breaks in half, then you have zero brakes, not even 10%. You have no brakes because that bolt will just fall right out. The custom one had threads on both sides, just the way it was set up. But 
Will kind of had that in the back of his mind the whole time that, man, like any one of these brake pedal pushes could be my last one. And mm-hmm. uh, we even, Mark's got the car back out in Nevada just till we get it back to Utah to start prepping. And I, I sent Mark a text because he had a photo of him driving it to work one day in Nevada. Now he lives in a little small <laughs> town. Totally good to go. And I said, just as a reminder, Mark, that bolt could go at any mm. time. Man. It's yeah. still the old bolt. It's still <laughs> yeah. the, the trail repair fix, man. Like, this uh, is not a fixed race car. So right. please don't no, drive it more than five miles an hour, you know. No sustain 85 on the highway. Yeah. No, 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 man. And we don't have any, we don't have a park break on that. It's all been, all that stuff's been gutted for weight and simplicity. So, yeah, a lot of fun photos are bringing only been a few weeks but some great memories dude that's a fantastic shot yeah that's awesome <laughs> that's a hell of a duo with the two of those trucks they they look oh. so good <laughs> just ugh. um all right i know we're uh we're crunching on time as we get towards oh. the hour plus mark so can you tell me anything about the uh the gx460 build you guys did with lexus just as i yeah yeah absolutely do, do so my, that was do my a... own research on this you know and, yeah, and no try worries. to no further into my, you know. So this year I've been really fortunate. Uh, I think we did a little bit with them last year. We, a few years ago, we did the J201 build. And that was with Expedition Overland. That's a supercharged mm-hmm. LX570 that Rochelle uh, went and were based in, raced in the Rebel Rally with. Right. Oh, mm-hmm. Wonderful photo. I love it. Uh, <laughs> so we did the J201, and that that's kind of was a great relationship and a lot of fun. And that vehicle kind of turned some heads. And obviously that was – Lexus's way, in my opinion, this is purely speculation of staying in the LX market and obviously kind of something new came of it, right? Like keep people excited about the LX platform. Yeah. Well, now we've got the GX and they've kind of been doing some fun builds on the GX. And one of those was the uh, the Nori Green one that we did. And we actually used that. You just had the picture of it pull up. We, we did uh, some events for Lexus, both for media and for the public at different events, including uh, the Overland Expo uh, Pacific Northwest and the Mountain mm-hmm. West event where we did, we had the vehicles there. We had the J201, that LX. We had a couple of GXs at different times, including the built one. And we did training in the Lexus booth. So tire repair, communication, recovery, mm-hmm. some really cool hands-on training uh, that Lexus kind of sponsored. And it's like the last thing people expect of Lexus. Bingo. And it, it like blew people away. Like we had, we had booths full, like very good uh, attendance to these tire repair classes. We had, it was awesome. Toyo gave us a brand new tire that we're drilling holes in and putting plugs <laughs> and had people up there using tire repair kits and talking about yep. recovery gear. That's and fun. I had, this is not even a joke. People came up to me at the Lexus booth and I had a Lexus shirt on. We're, we're co- private contractors doing training and doing the vehicle builds for, but it's, for all intents and purposes, like we were Lexus employees there representing Lexus, right? Sure. People came up to me and were like, I'm so glad Lexus is here. I've had a Lexus for a lot of years, but I always have to tell all my friends that Lexuses can be awesome off-road vehicles. And now you guys are finally here showing that. Mm. They were like getting emotional, like pumped, <laughs> like, hey, Lexus is finally here saying, hey, we yeah. build cool off-road machines. And I, we've all known that. I mean, the industry... The, it's no secret right. that the, the LX is an amazing platform dating clear back to the 80 series chassis, right? Right. And yeah. The, uh, yeah. 4757. Yeah. Seven- With a lot of really cool companies, CBI, ARB, um, equipped, Alibox, Toyo, just kind of built a really yep. fun lifestyle one. Something groundbreaking as far as like, the, the components used because there's already just so much cool stuff. But the whole point of that one was to build something that can go be used. And that actually mm-hmm. did some media drives where we had both uh, media drive participants from kind of a lot of like uh, YouTube and uh, some print magazine uh, journalists there at the Destination mm-hmm. Outdoor event. But also we were fortunate to have some engineering staff from Japan, including like some uh, GX and Prado platform engineers come spend time in that vehicle and, and, understand why the u.s market does some of these things to these vehicles because we otherwise take a beautiful brand new vehicle and then we go change everything about them. exactly uh, no one I, can ever put the I same r&d that the, the oe does right like everything they do is better than what we can normally kind of come but we do have to change it to meet our needs suspension right. height bumpers approach mm-hmm. clearance sliders so it was a lot of fun to spend the time on the trail with them uh we did it with that vehicle at the destination outdoor event. And then I had another team come out during SEMA and we took out an LX 600 and a 
a previous GX build that we had kind of helped with XO and uh, Lexus on. And we took those off-roading and take engineers and product planning staff out to go see mm-hmm. why we modify these vehicles. So what was, uh, what was the suspension on that, on that GX? <laughs> The GX, the Nori Green one has the old man EMU BP51. So it's got their remote reservoir bypass. Mm. Right, heard so heard very stuff. good things about those. I'm a big fan. I love it. Yeah. It's it's good to hear you vouching for these because I've had so many people look at me and say, wait a minute, you're taking a Lexus off road. I'm like, oh, and I have to go, you know, and do the whole like, it's a Lexus, but it's, but it's not anywhere else <laughs> in the world thing, you know. Right. And it's like, This was this is kind of funny. When this happened at the event we did uh, over the Expo West last year, we left the event with a, a a group from Lexus USA, like some of their product planning team, and they're not always like Lexus enthusiasts necessarily. Maybe they've come from Toyota, but they could have been on a car mm-hmm. platform. But they're all eager to learn, and that's why they go on these trips. That was one that we organized with Expedition Overland, and we took them on like a two three day vehicle trip with their vehicles and with some of ours to kind of see why people are doing these things. And, I was in the vehicle with a, a product planner for, he's like. That uh, I don't hear about on the news later anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, but he was asking like, hey, what's up with like Lexus owners taking the badges off and putting Toyota badges on? I was oh, like, man. I was like, you know, you're not wrong. That happens. And there's companies selling kits and doing grill badges. I said, And it is pretty fascinating that the U S market's like the only one that, uh, in my, that I've seen traveling that somebody would take the premium vehicle being the Lexus and maybe downgrade it to the Toyota, which truthfully is because the Lexus is, it is everything that the Prado is. And then some, it's not a Prado. It's nicer than a Prado. It's got a big eight. It's got better sound deadening. It's got a lot of, it's uh, weird. It's weird that in 2022 coming up on 2023, we're talking about, you know, good steering in an LX 600 and Lexus is building, you know, a, a five liter naturally aspirated V8 IS 500. Like what world is this? It's the only friggin' you know, sports sedan with an NAV8. It's that, uh, they're doing some cool things and they're, uh, I'm excited. I hope, I hope to see some more cool things. We're back, Chris. Yeah. That was, that was new and different because all of a sudden just both screens went blank and went, your computer has crashed. I was like, it's a Mac. It, they never crash. Did you get the the pinwheel of death? No, I got like a message. It was like, you can press any key to restart your Like this is really weird. Anyway, so. Did it, did it save the last half of the sh- like the stuff we did? I don't know. I've got a button over here that says convert now for, and I'm going to hit that at the end. Okay. Um, Normally it does uh, somewhere between a normal 200 series and that price. They're amazing. And those that's all public info now because those are formally for sale. Um, so they're really cool packages. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to have to get on a website later and figure that oh, out. Yes. Oh, do, they're, they're, they're shareable. They're kind of hard to see. I know this is a really bad way to do it, but they're. Oh my they're God, those are amazing. <laughs> Malta 200s. Uh, so we're building seven of those. And those are brand new. Her- those are like start at zero mileage heritage edition 200s. What? And then they get shipped to Germany and they're cutting everything off from the B pillar back of the body and they're building those composite camper. That's a pop up camper, a full living. It's got full living stuff inside, fridge, stove, all the goods, water, heater system. And then we do the suspension, gears, lockers, winch, bumper, sliders, uh, a <laughs> whole bunch of all the electrical, all the little goodies. So they are turnkey. Um, the best way to put it, that is a turnkey global expedition vehicle, like ready to drive around the world or camp in your backyard. Dude, okay. That's amazing. Uh, what gears, what lockers and what winches are you running on those? <laughs> yeah. So those are getting, um, they're all getting factory Toyota gear sets, but a lot, uh, a deeper ratio. So mm-hmm. the 16 plus truck with the eight speed transmission behind the three, UR went to a 3.307 with the okay. eight speed. And so we're changing all those to 390 gears. So it's like a 20% uh, gear change, which is pretty significant, but helps a lot with the larger with tire the size weight. Yeah, and, and the weight. weight. Yeah. They're amazingly not that heavy. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on their bumpers, but they're not much, they're, they're not as heavy as my personal 200 because 
they take all that body and glass out and then they build a composite camper. So that camper only weighs a couple hundred pounds more than all mm -hmm. the body they took off of it. Um, we do have auxiliary fuel sense. tanks on them and then they're all getting worn winches on a slee mm -hmm. off-road front bumper, slee sliders, a lot of Baja design lighting, a lot of cool stuff, dual batteries, um, like I said, onboard uh, hot water and heater system. Yeah. Oh, what, uh, what weight winch are you, are you running a 12? They are 12 K winches. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I, I have the, the, the worn, um, Oh God, what's it called? You uh, better know. You're going to talk to Andy. Uh, soon. I know Andy's <laughs> going to, Andy's going to be on the <laughs> show in like two weeks. The Zevo, the 12 okay. S yep. Zevo. Yeah. So like these are kind of the, the yeah CR, yeah, you know, yeah, 12 yeah, yeah. we're using um yeah. great winches awesome great. the best yeah. the absolute best so they yeah i'll, I'll build that and then they have uh, arab air lockers front and rear so they're dual lock trucks triple lock as everyone likes to say since they have a factory center <laughs> ah yes triple lock I'm, I'm not going to use that word they have Wait. dual lockers dual locking differentials and... <laughs> man there is no bigger like catchphrase you know like attention grabbing thing in the off-road world than triple locked with a <laughs> with an 80 especially it with is, a toyota or a lexus yes dude oh my god on if, no. if it doesn't say triple locked on a bringer trailer listing nobody's gonna, no nobody cares like, Here, here's what's so crazy about oh like not a day goes by that i don't either have this conversation on a forum or facebook or customers calling the shop here and wanting to, I'm not gonna say argue, but maybe a lot of a lot of them know what the what's actually happening with the center dip, right? A lot of many of them know, but there's people who think like, well, triple lockers are better than two lockers, so like a lot a triple locked 80 series is better than one that doesn't have the button or something. You're like, at the end of the day, like the CDL, all that's doing is, as you guys know, locking the TKS one to one. But like, people think that oh man, it's a bummer that you can't get that in the brand new 70 series. Well, because the 70 series still has a factory part-time case. So when it's in four-wheel drive, it's automatically locked. Mm -hmm. from yeah. from the like, we don't <laughs> yeah. need to have a button because oh, it just man. does it when you, you take the manhandle and go from two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive, right? <laughs> but you can have this conversation that somehow that's an inferior drivetrain system because it doesn't have the triple locker. It doesn't have this input button. And we sell a lot of part-time conversion kits for 80s and 100s and LXs and 470s that actually make it so you have hubs on the front. And then your T case is part-time, meaning you just have two-wheel mm -hmm. drive or four-wheel drive. And people get really upset. Well, like, well, but the but the center dips better. You're like, no, it's not. It's just it's different. And right. there are great conditions for full time four wheel drive. It's I'm not telling anyone to go do a part time conversion. We sell plenty of parts for the full time ones too. But um, don't think that because you have the extra button on the dash, it makes that vehicle any more invincible than something <laughs> that has a true part time T case. They also could lock their T case up with a shift lever. So <laughs> it's so funny how like people's yeah. minds. Yeah, this triple lock thing is like, ah, oh, it's triple lock, bro. Is it even? Awesome, cool story. It doesn't matter because <laughs> it's all perceived capability. <laughs> it's perceived capability for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and the ADT That's case, fine. it's the nerdery, but it's the HF2A and the HF2AV. Great T cases in the full time four wheel drive, but so is the HF1A, which is a part time version. <laughs> when you put mm -hmm. it four wheel drive, both the front and rear, still man, twisted, just like those locked ones. Oh, God. I think you, I don't know if you and I actually were involved in the same conversation on mud, but like. There's conversations about the part-time T cases for 470s. And I, I threw a comment in there. I was like, I'd love to see one for a 460. And everybody was like, it's gonna be impossible. Whoa. It's gonna be so much money. And I was like, okay, but can we do it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd love to run part-time and then just have a one-to-one, -one, you know. But It'd it's, be cool. yeah, it's it's it, as far as the internet's it's concerned, it'll cool. it'll never be the triple yeah. loss. Like yeah. ugh. It's doable on the GX though, like with using T cases from a uh, part time, like a pro it's absolutely yeah. doable. FJ yeah. with beefed up internals or something. Yeah, it. it's yeah. it's how much do you want to cut and how much money do you don't want to spend. That's um, what it comes down. To. <laughs> and uh, like Land Cruiser guys, there's there's two camps of the part time world. We'll get this a total another weird tangent, but um, it, you either love it because you probably have it, or you hate it and you've never actually had it. You have yeah. no use case in your world of why you want to be in two wheel drive. 
I don't say it's for fuel economy. Like some people claim better fuel economy. I say it's because like sometimes it's nice to drive something that's rear wheel drive. Like maybe on the road, but like actually it's mm-hmm. really fun to drive off road when it has two wheel drive. Yeah. The ability to switch into high, like four wheel like drive, a, right? Like a suburban in the snow today. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> that's a good time, right? And uh, yeah. so sometimes the use case is just because it's fun to drive. <laughs> Land cruisers have some steering cap- some steering characteristics that aren't always ideal. And a lot of that's because of the push they have from full-time four-wheel drive, right? They're, they're mm-hmm. notorious uh, kind of big boat handling and two-wheel drive changes that. But um, people like sometimes like want to beat me up like, oh, man, you all you want to do is sell your part-time kits. Like, I'm more than happy to sell full-time four-wheel drive parts too because guess what wears <laughs> out faster on a the full-time Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The front end. So I'm happy yeah, right. to sell a lot of <laughs> Right, uh, all you want, man. Yeah, say so, I've bought front axle rebuild kits from you already. <laughs> yeah. and, and I remember I, that. With this is like, hey, there's a, a little over like 10 million 70 series out there in this world these days now, from 1985 to current. I've never Crazy. had a call from one of them saying, hey, how can I make this thing full time four wheel drive? Like, not one right. of them wants to go right. full time four wheel drive. I'm not yeah. saying there isn't someone out there that would probably think that would be neat, but the reality is, is like the, the part-time system works pretty dang well too. It's a truck. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a four. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, triple locked. Awesome. Yeah. Triple locked. Awesome. <laughs> Meanwhile, in all of our fantasies, we all have diesel manual and manual transfer case, you know, right. troopies. Right. yeah. Tro- yeah, factory, pretty much troop. Yeah. With with factory with, hubs on it. Right. That's factory right. hubs, <laughs> factory rear locker, you know, like it's, yeah, it's, and who even wants like dream push the dream. four-wheel drive anyway, right? Everyone wants, I want a J-shift, high, neutral, low, four, you know, like no one wants to have push button stuff, which mm. every full-time one has. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Grass is always greener. <sighs> Ain't that the truth? As long as it's not in a Jeep. <laughs> which that's the last manual handles I had was uh, in a Jeep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, same. Yeah. Like. My- 04 TJ, which has been forever gone now. So, <laughs> and and we're recording a show with the guy that I bought mine from in a in a few weeks. So nice. Well, the reality is, there's I I think more than ever on the market, there's really cool platforms available from every manufacturer. Four by fours are getting. I, mm-hmm. I mean, they're getting more electronic and certainly harder to modify, but they're also like some pretty cool, capable vehicles. I I don't own a Bronco and probably will never own a Bronco, but I think they're a neat vehicle. I Jeep always been making some cool stuff as of, as a recent. Ford's got some cool stuff. So mm-hmm. you know, GMC's got some cool things with their AT platforms and everyone's making cool things. I just happen to like Toyota and they have some great platforms these days too. Always yeah. if uh if you couldn't buy another Toyota or a Lexus, what would you buy? Oh man, I'd probably walk. I'd just be a rock. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to drift cars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it'd be a, it'd be a <laughs> Nissan S15 for him. Right. <laughs> Dotson. I don't know. That's, I've never owned a car. I, I had a car in college. I guess I had a little Honda Civic, but I, I didn't aspire to be a car person. It was just like cheap commuter. I always had a, I had a Land Cruiser. Just that was too expensive. And I, I was taken apart in the driveway. So I had a little car. But other than that, I've actually just, truthfully, I've never owned another vehicle. So I've never owned, <laughs> I've never not had a Land Cruiser. And I've only ever owned like, I think that Honda and I had a Suzuki Samurai, but those are like miniature Land Cruisers. Yeah. So I count that in the same DNA. But yeah, I never really like... owned a car. And I, I don't know that I could own a car. It just doesn't hmm. uh, like when I say a car, like a passenger car, a little sedan. Right. I don't they look fun. I have some employees that have some rad little BMW and like little tuner stuff that look fun, but they just don't do anything for me. They don't get me to the places <laughs> I like to go. What about four by fours? What are troopers, Monteros? Uh, troopers are rad. Monteros, I like them all, man. Troopers are rad. I love old wheel. Yeah. I love an old wheelies. I mean, I, there's a lot of cool. The Bronco, I could see buying a. Uh, I like older Broncos and newer Broncos and OJ Broncos. I think they're all cool. OJ Broncos. OJ Broncos. Yes, a three o a three o two and a Bronco with a five you know the five speed out of the. Fox body would actually be yeah. rad. That'd be pretty well, rad. Like old yeah. K five Blazers around. I mean, that's. Mm-hmm. I, I sell Land Cruiser parts all day, every day. Drive, uh, do a lot with Toyotas all day, every day. But like, kind of the first to say too, it'd be boring if everybody were just into Toyotas. Like, I'm glad, yeah, that, like, cool mm-hmm. enthusiast group, and I'm glad that people are passionate about their vehicles. But yeah. I'm equally as happy that there's a passionate Jeep groups and passionate Bronco guys because I have zero animosity. Some of my dearest friends are in those camps and in those crowds because it'd be boring if everybody liked Toyotas. Dude, likewise, I mean, man, in the ATV world, like. If there wasn't Polaris owners talking shit about Can-Am owners and Can-Am owners talking shit about Polaris owners and whatnot, like 
yeah, there just wouldn't be anything fun to talk about. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's human yeah. nature. It, and, it, yeah, it, it is. It's tribes. It is. It's yeah. tribes. Yeah. Well, and it's cool, but people get a little too extreme. Like if you're if you refuse to associate with other groups because yeah. they're not part of your like marquee <laughs> tribe, mm-hmm. like that's a little over the top. Unless you own Toyota or you own <laughs> Ford, that's over the top to me, yeah. right? That's like a little much. Yeah. Like I look at our off-road recovery team, like the I couldn't even tell you what half the I, I could basically because I've been on the trail, but like there's zero process of knowing what vehicle somebody drives as long as it's like a capable quality four by four. The International yep. Four Wheel Drive Trainers Association is in the same way. Like when you fill out an application to that, you don't put down what your vehicle is and, and all your ridiculous <laughs> check and make you know, mm-hmm. which which wheels you have on there, right? Like that's not a build <laughs> right. thing, a checkbox. It's it's you should just be spending time with cool people in the outdoors regardless of what they drive and if they happen to be toyota oh, yeah. owners that's cool too yep. dude that's 100 exactly. percent the way, the way we feel <laughs> it's yep. good we we happen to have had a lot of toyotas in the past but that's that like my main friend one's a land rover guy the other one's got a 100 series like that's i've owned, just the way it is i've owned uh seven different makes of four by fours so <laughs> you're a full spectrum man like, there's not too many yeah more man than- Brand, there is no brand loyalty, you know. It's cool. It Have you had a Land Rover yet? Uh, no. Okay, so that would make it eight. I'm just, I'm just being creative now. <laughs> I won't say that I've been looking at them, but I won't say I haven't been looking at them. <laughs> Do we'll it. talk about that. We'll talk about that at a later show. Yes, we will. So. Kurt, uh, I, yeah, I would ask you, is there anything you want to plug? But other than I don't think we've mentioned Cruiser Outfitters the whole episode, though. Maybe a tiny bit. I mean, uh, yes, yeah, so my day job and uh, the, the bulk of my time and efforts in life go to Cruiser Outfitters, which is where I happen to be here now working a little late, stick catching up, just got back in town. But we yeah, do all recovery. things, <laughs> all things Toyota four by fours as far as like suspension and, and components. But the bulk of our world is. Um, the Land Cruiser pl- platforms, both everything from uh, 40 series all the way up into 200s and working on 600 and on US 300 mm-hmm. stuff and, and Prado nice. parts too. So the honestly, the bulk of what we do is the boring stuff, bearing seals and gaskets, but it's we stock every <laughs> gasket for a 40 series, you know, everything we can. So that's, yeah. that's kind of our world is the parts. Without that stuff, you're not getting anywhere fun. So that's it. That's it. You got to gotta keep the things yep. moving first. Yeah. Yep. And I can... And- Totally vouch for the front axle rebuild kit on the 80s. It's fantastic. <laughs> Those <laughs> pictures are still out there somewhere of it of it parched in your driveway. Yeah, so, I was in my garage dude. for a long time. So, but that was dude, that was yeah. more uh, me, not the parts that I bought to put on. Yes. It, so. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Kurt, and you're still on the uh, the museum board. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so definitely still involved with the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum. So, if anyone uh, is making their way out to Salt Lake or needs a reason to get to Salt Lake, let the museum be that that purpose. It's a, an amazing facility, has just about 100 Land Cruisers in the building right at this minute. There's kind of always some new ones on their way and new stuff in the works, but it's an amazing facility. It's excellent for tours and bring your family or mm-hmm. come spend the day. So yeah, still do the museum. Uh, we just had, we had Cruiser Fest probably, yeah, definitely since last time we chatted, which is our annual big event in September. We'll be doing that in September of 2023 as well, which is kind of a, all things celebration of Land Cruiser. People come from all over the U.S. to be part of that. And then, yeah, you can follow Kangaroo oh. Racing, which is the desert racing, Kangaroo yeah. Racing on social media platforms. A lot of stuff there. And I'm trying to think, man, what else? That's that's all the basics. There's a Nordic series goes, coming out in February. Cool. Yep, new Nordic series. Yeah, Expedition Nordland series will come <laughs> out in January, February. And uh, I just I don't ever get too far away from this one industry. I guess I'm. I must like it, not too burned out. So <laughs> my world. Uh, yeah. That's where the fun it's, is. It's a fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we we enjoy getting a glimpse of your world, but we definitely Seriously. like being in the same space. Oh, it's great. Man. Yeah. And that's yeah. a cool industry and cool people. And, and everyone does it because they enjoy it, right? We're not like compelled to own four by fours necessarily. I mean, yep. maybe a few people in the US and North America <laughs> could make that case, but really mm. we do it because we like it. And that's the most enjoyable people to spend time with is because they enjoy doing it. Yeah. Yep. Thousand percent. Yeah. Well, sweet. We wouldn't have done almost 150 shows if this wasn't what we loved. <laughs> yeah, we are closing in on 150. It's like 144-ish, uh-huh. like 143-ish. I'm normally pretty right, close right. to that. I don't remember tonight. Yep. 
I, well, when you get to another historically historically significant number, like two hundred, I want to be back for two hundred. We'll talk <laughs> only about two hundred series land cruisers. Deal. For the oh man, time. <laughs> dude, that would actually be a really funny thing if we have like, like, I mean, that the, means we don't get to talk about the LX until six hundred, though. That's yeah, true. but uh, we yeah, could talk about GX four seventies <laughs> at the one fifty. There you go, one fifty series. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 120, 150. You got you got a bunch yep. coming up here. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. and, we, and we just dug ourselves. A 120's gone, man. Yeah. So yeah, one fifty. Oh boy. Oh man. Do we even miss hole. the 105s? Yeah, if you did, that ship has sailed. That's this is a rabbit hole. Okay. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, I'll wrap it up real fast. You can rate and review the show uh, wherever you listen to to podcasts. Uh, you can like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, I didn't reopen my Chrome, so I'm doing this off of memory right now. Uh, Kurt is at Cruiser Kurt and then at Cruiser Outfitters and then it's at Kangaroo Racing. It's C A N J G oh, G U R O. Yep, you got it. King oh, oh, man, out of my brain. That's, you had it phonetically hurt. right. Yeah. Uh, if you find Kurt, you'll be able to find the race team. They, he's, easy he's enough. True. Yeah. Yeah. He's true. Easy enough. Ross is no, not like the one from Friends. And I'm at Overlanding Dad. And that's it. We did a show. Thank you so much, Kurt. Yeah. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, guys. Not, not and uh, see if I can recover the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, and and this is our last show of 22. So thank happy you to everybody for listening and happy new year. <laughs>